So we are recording and we'd like to welcome Dr. Sarah Vaya for this presentation. Um, she is a professor with the University of Maryland Department of Entomology. She's also a climate extension specialist with the University of Maryland Extension. So very lucky to have her joining us for three of three of this uh, climate change series. And today's presentation will be focused on regenerative landscaping. So Dr. Vaya, if you're ready, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate um, the support of these webinars. And I'm kind of sad, actually, that this is the last webinar um, in the series for the Master Gardener. So I'll have to come up with some new stuff so that I can <laughs> join you all in another webinar in the future. Uh, today, I want to talk about suburban landscapes. I think the last time, uh, let me just refresh. Um, if you haven't been present for the previous webinars, the first one I gave was on healthy soil, and that is that was recorded and is on the HGIC channel. And the second one I gave is on regenerative gardening, and by gardening I meant vegetable gardening, basically food gardening. And this one is about landscaping, um, uh, essentially all the spaces around your home and um, and in uh, non-residential spaces too. So we'll just get going. Um, I want to put the uh, the webinar into a context um, and let you know just very briefly that we have four pretty serious environmental problems going now. And I want to um, uh, help you understand how landscaping, suburban landscaping, can um, help us with each of these problems. So the first problem, of course, is the climate problem. Um, all of you are familiar with that, of course. But um, just to review, uh, the warming that we've experienced from uh, unprecedented increases in atmospheric CO2 that have come from burning fossil fuels is already causing really serious impacts on weather ecosystems, water, etc. And so for the best future, for a livable future really, we need to reduce CO2 emissions and remove carbon from the atmosphere. The second problem is the soil problem. So I discussed this in the first webinar. Um, soil and habitat in general for the um, both below ground for microbes and other organisms and above ground have been seriously degraded by conventional agricultural practices. And in uh, particular, the ability of the soil to soak up, hold and purify water is reduced and that contributes to the water problem. And the soil microbial communities and it's the microbes that do all the work in the soil, basically. These have been seriously degraded, which reduces their ability to decompose materials and release um, the nutrients in those materials. That's called nutrient cycling. Um, and because not as, uh, not as many natural nutrients reach the um, plants, reach the crops, farmers um, need to use more fertilizer and other chemicals. So this contributes to the water problem. And finally, habitat for natural enemies and pollinators has been lost. And um, that increases insect pests of crops because there are a lot of natural enemies out there that would eat the insect pests if they were there, if the enemies were there. Um, and this contributes to the biodiversity problem. Um, so the water problem. Uh, our streams and coastal waters like Chesapeake Bay have been heavily polluted by chemicals, pathogens, and sediment. Um, Pretty much this little cartoon pretty much shows you that <laughs> everything we do, uh, every bit of water that, um, that is deposited essentially will eventually run down into a body of water. So it washes um, all of the stuff off of our lawns, everything off of the roads and various chemicals that, um, that are coming out of the storm drains. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff that comes off of our lawns and I'll talk about that later. Um, uh, nutrient runoff, and by that I mean uh, nitrogen, phosphorus uh, that come from fertilizer and manure, increases pollution in the water and leads to the famous dead zones that we have in the Chesapeake Bay, but also that we have down in the Gulf of Mexico. And I just recently learned, and I thought this was so fascinating that I wanted to share it with you, that nitrogen runoff from the Midwest, this is a picture from a report from the Union of Concerned Scientists that came out maybe a month ago, um, so uh, when farmers apply fertilizer, nitrogen and phosphorus up here in the Midwest, it 
runs off and goes into water into the rivers and washes down here into the Gulf of Mexico. And it turns out that this is a big cause, the big cause of uh, the dead zone in, so a dead zone, let me re recap. A dead zone is caused by too much nutrient in the water. And then we get a big bloom of algae and then the algae die and the microbes decompose them, but they suck up all the oxygen while they do that. So um, that causes a dead zone, which is very hard on fish. So it turns out that the nitrogen coming down the, the rivers from the Midwest has cost Gulf fishermen up to $2.8 billion a year for the last 30 years, which is, I thought was unbelievable. Um, so uh, climate change has caused the rainfall patterns to change. So there's more heavy, uh, more of our rain comes as downpours. Um, we have a higher sea level and there's um, more that produces coastal flooding and there's also more inland flooding. And because we have all this heavy rain, we're getting a lot more erosion and runoff. So erosion produces sediment in the, in the water bodies. So finally, more summer heat from climate change. Uh, the streams are hotter, this is hard on fish, and there's also more drought. So finally, the biodiversity problem. Um, we've had a huge loss of habitat and biodiversity from development, climate change, and our agricultural practices. And in landscaping, so the topic of today, um, our reliance on mowed turf grass, uh, which is a monoculture of introduced plants, causes habitat loss and reduces insect biodiversity because there's pretty much, uh, except for Japanese beetle grubs, there's pretty much nothing that's going to live in, um, in uh, turf grass. So a loss of birds and insects from the suburban landscapes in uh, this introduced monoculture of grass threatens ecosystem function because we don't have uh, the array of organisms we're supposed to have. And it also allows insect pests to increase um, uh, uh, while threatening the native insects that um, pollinate our flowers and our crops. So we've, we've kind of got these four big problems and uh, it turns out that um, our landscaping practices contribute to all four. So how can we solve these problems? I think we need to rethink our suburban landscapes and um, you know, sort of in ways uh, that will allow us to actually embrace, not just sort of grudgingly use practices, but embrace practices that will restore the soil, okay, reduce emissions and sequester carbon, help the water problem by increasing infiltration, reduce flooding, re, uh, boost water holding, et cetera, and rebuild and bur, bur, rebuild bird and insect populations. So if we can uh, implement landscaping practices that will do these things, it will help us solve, first of all, the soil problem, then the climate, water, and biodiversity problems. So that would be a real move forward in terms of um, environmental, um, sustainability. So how are we going to do this? I think uh, when it comes to rethinking the suburban landscape, the, the main thing basically is to rethink the lawn <laughs> and increase our use of native perennials in, um, in our home landscapes and also in municipal landscapes and co commercial landscapes. So uh, let's talk about lawn for a little bit. I think it's not really a question that lawn is pretty much the default landscape, okay? If you, if you uh, buy a new house, like one of these from Ryan Homes, this is on their website, I really love this. Um, this is the American dream, you know, in at least Ryan Homes' mind, uh, where you have a gigantic house and it's surrounded by uh, acres of pristine mowed turf grass with maybe a couple of little shrubs around the house, maybe a few annuals planted here. Uh, this is kind of the stereotype of what a great landscape should look like. And so um, it turns out in the U.S. that there's a long history of lawn as a symbol of wealth and home ownership. So it's all tied up with this home thing. Um, although there's plenty of lawn in other places too around municipal buildings uh, because it's just a kind of no, I, you don't have to think about it to put a lawn in. Um, but the thing about lawns as this symbol of wealth and home ownership is it's almost like saying, uh, and I think it 
goes back to Europe where people really did think this. I am so well off. I've got this beautiful house and I'm so well off that I don't need to um, have anything planted around my house that would provide food or fiber or anything useful. I can have this completely decorative landscape. Um, and uh, as I just mentioned, it, lawn doesn't take a whole lot of thought to choose and install. I think most of us are very familiar with lawn. And um, Ryan Holmes will put a lawn in for you if you buy a house for them, as will all developers. They'll put a little teeny bit of topsoil and put a, um, a little bit of turf grass seed on there and, and call it done. Um, the thing about lawn upkeep is it's really familiar, right? We're all used to it. Most of us, um, most of you are not as old as me, but I certainly remember in my suburb where I grew up outside Detroit in the 50s, all the dads were out mowing their lawn um, on the weekends. Although, as I remember, this was again, way, way back, but my dad had a push mower, which was you know, kind of back to the future, probably not considered very cool then, but would be a lot cooler now. Um, anyway, most of us grew up with lawn care, okay? With the mowers going all weekend around us, et cetera. Um, lawn care is something you can easily hire out. There's a lot and lot of uh, contractors who will be happy to come and mow your lawn every week, <laughs> whether it needs it or not. And um, so you don't have to do it if you don't want to. And this makes all of these things together, make lawn the most common municipal and commercial landscape. But there's a dark side of lawn, as you knew I was going to get to this. Um, there are these environmental impacts and it's also expensive to maintain lawn. Um, the environmental cost of lawn. Let's just review a few little facts about lawn. Um, across the U.S. there are 42 million acres of lawn. This makes uh, mowed turf grass or lawn our largest irrigated crop. There's more acres in lawn than in corn and soybeans combined. Um, just in Maryland alone, there's 1.3 million acres of lawn. And by the way, there's 1.28 million acres of cropland. So there's as much cropland as much lawn as cropland in Maryland. And again, lawn is providing no food, no fiber, nothing useful. Um, nationwide, lawn uses between 30 and 50% of our municipal water. Um, yard tools contribute 5% of US carbon emissions. Um, uh, and of course, that's the, uh, the cause of climate change. Um, Well-meaning um, homeowners and, uh, and other people who are in landscaping companies spill about 17 million gallons of fuel every year filling up their lawnmowers. Um, lawns are often over-fertilized. And that means that nitrate, NO3, runs off. That's a soluble form of nitrogen. And nitrous oxide, N2O, is emitted. And nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas, like 140 times or something like that, more potent than per molecule than carbon dioxide. And so um, well, the uh, over fertilizing of the lawn and the runoff of lawn fertilizer is contributing to the water problem and the climate problem. Um, it turns out, uh, and um, this is, comes from the EPA, although it's been scrubbed from their website, I couldn't find it anymore uh, on the website. I went to a page that said this doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, um, 10 times more nitrogen and chemical runoff um, comes from lawns, this is per acre, per acre than from agricultural fields. So farmers sometimes take a, um, you know, get a real bad rap for polluting the water, but actually it, a lot of the excess uh, fertilizer is coming from lawns. And as I uh, previously mentioned, uh, lawn is a monoculture of introduced species of um, turf grass that are bred specifically to do look like this, right? And so they um, they require a lot of maintenance. So lawn contributes to all four of those key environmental problems. Um, I wanted to show you some information from California because I really couldn't believe um, what I read about yard tools in California. Okay. How many yard tools are there in California? Just for a point of information, there's 13.7 million passenger vehicles. Well, there's 12.9 million pieces of residential lawn and garden tools, mowers, uh, 
uh, weed whackers, et cetera. And another 1.5 million um, uh, yard tools in um, commercial lawn and garden. So there are more yard tools in California than passenger vehicles. Now, what about emissions? Um, one hour of lawnmower use, lawnmowers are very inefficient, um, is, uh, is equal in terms of emissions um, from burning the gas. Um, it's equal to driving 300 miles from Los Angeles to, to, Cal to uh, Las Vegas in a Toyota Camry. Okay, now, so that's a, you know, average car that gets um, sort of average mileage. One hour of lawnmower use equals 300 miles of driving. One hour of leaf blower use. Now, every time I see a leaf blower, I have been cringing because that is equal to driving 1,100 miles. Okay, so it's almost four times as much emissions comes from a gasoline-powered leaf blower. Very, very inefficient. And you have to ask yourself, <laughs> do we really need to blow the clippings off of the driveway? Uh, pretty much every commercial um, lawn mowing service will do that because uh, many, many homeowners will, um, will require that. Okay, now this is the other little piece of information that's pretty amazing. Smog farming emissions, tons per day. So this is smog farming stuff. Uh, in about 2021, they're expecting yard tools to exceed cars as sources of carbon emissions in California. And I just have to say, <laughs> whoa, that's not good. That seems, well, not necessary. Okay, uh-oh, wait a minute, where's the picture? What happened? Huh. Well, this is interesting. This has not happened to me before. There should be pictures here. Um, let me see. I hope all my pictures aren't going to be gone. Whoa. Look, they're sort of coming in and out, aren't they? Uh, We're seeing if, them kind of like flash there and then they go away. Yeah, what if I, um, if I uh, stop screen sharing for just a second and restart this PowerPoint so yeah, that I can- I'm um, gonna pause the recording. I'm sorry, oh, you're picking the recording up again? Okay. Yep. Yeah, all Thanks. right. So um, hopefully, I don't know what happened, uh, but hopefully this will um, <laughs> keep working. So it costs a lot to cut the grass and um, everybody probably knows this, but I'd like to just ask you to think, what was the last time you actually thought about how much money you're spending in your budget to keep the grass taken care of? Um, if you, if, excuse me, if you own your own home. Um, you can mow your lawn yourself. I got these figures from a, um, a, a site online. So I think these are for a, a national figures. You can buy a fancy lawn mower um, uh, or a push mower, depending on the size of your um, lot. But then you also have to maintain it. You have to buy oil and tune it up and you know, do, do other stuff, put gasoline in it. Um, you have to pay for fertilizers and herbicides and insecticides and fungicides if you do the whole nine yards um, and gasoline, plus your time. And this site um, estimates it's about 70 to 100 hours per year to cut the grass. So uh, even when you do it yourself and spend a lot of time, it costs you some money. Um, it's even more expensive, of course, if you hire someone to do it. Um, I showed this slide at a, um, at a talk I gave um, well before we had to shut down everything. Um, and I said the average lawn mowing price for half an acre is $45. And the, my audience in Columbia, Maryland was just laughing. They're like, well, uh, no, for a quarter acre in Columbia, it's more like $90 a time. Um, and if you mow it 30 times, well, that's a lot of money per year. And I noticed my neighbor who has a lawn service, they come, it's rained a lot this summer, so her, her grass has been growing, but last summer they came every week, whether it rained or not, whether the grass was growing or not. So they were sort of just churning the dust around for a long time. Um, and you're still paying for that every week. So, and again, the lawn services um, will sell packages for for aeration and um, um, pre-emergent herbicide and a whole fertilizer program, et cetera. So the cost mounts up and um, just think to yourself, well, what could I do with that money that um, if I didn't have to spend so much on the lawn? Um, the cost of mowed open space. I think that, uh, well, I know I found this amazing. Um, Howard County, Maryland, that's where I live, uh, has about 4,000 acres, probably more, more like 5,000, but 4,000 acres at least of mowed turf grass. This is outside of parks. Columbia, Maryland has 1,600 acres of mowed turf grass, again, outside of the parks. 
And the, these, all these acres, 5,600 acres altogether, are mowed every one or two weeks during the summer. And so that means that um, emissions are, carbon emissions are coming from burning thousands of gallons of diesel every summer. Tons of fertilizer and chemicals are applied. And when I um, asked, I asked the open space operations manager of, of Columbia Association how much they spend to, um, on, per acre to maintain it over the summer. And he said $750 per acre, but that's using their equipment and their people, which they paid for separately. Um, when I posed the same question to a uh, utilities um, um, supervisor at Howard County, he told me $2,000 an acre. $2,000 an acre for 4,000 acres. So that's, unless I got my math wrong, $8 million a year to just cut the grass in Howard County, basically. Um, if we had a different vision of the open space, uh, it could be part of the climate solution instead of part of the problem. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. Now, why does lawn need so much maintenance in the first place? Here's, um, this is the ground level here. And so this is the below ground part, the roots and the above ground part of a bunch of native plants seen here. And in this little box is lawn. And so you can see that the roots of these native plants go down 10 to 15 feet. You know, a few of them maybe only go down five feet. The roots of lawn, you can't even see on this picture. You know, they go down like three inches, okay? And that's why lawn needs so much maintenance. I think of lawn as like the infant of plants. You have to give it everything. It doesn't have enough roots to gather enough water, gather enough for uh, uh, nutrients, et cetera. So you have to constantly be providing it with things. So the question I wanna address is what can we do to minimize the cost of lawn? Um, there are various approaches to reducing lawn um, and its impact. One is you can just remove the lawn or remove a lot of the lawn and replace it with native plants. And um, that's what um, this woman, Ingrid Blanton, did. I met her at a, um, a garden club in Easton where I went and gave a talk. And she just took the whole lawn off of her yard and um, spent a lot of time putting in new plants and organizing this. And now she has this beautiful backyard. And this is micro clover, by the way. Um, this is awesome. Now, that is a lot of work. And I would like to suggest that while saying, hey, it would be great to remove the lawn, is okay for experienced gardeners. It can be really threatening to regular people. When you go to a regular, you know, uh, talk to a person who is not a super gardener, and you say, I think you should re remove your lawn or reduce your lawn. I've talked to a lot of these folks, and they, they're like, panicked because what, what am I going to do with it? How am I going to get the lawn out of there? It's going to be a lot of work. I don't know what to do. And so it's kind of threatening. So um, just, I would like to see a very um, a sort of more moderated approach to this. It's, it's great if you can do what she did, but not everybody can do that. And it's hard to find alternatives for large scale landscapes, like, you know, municipal landscapes. Um, and so it, it, uh, I think it doesn't go very far to just say, we've got to get rid of the lawn. Um, another approach you could take, and this works, this is pretty much what the municipal people do. And also uh, it works to a certain extent if you're not um, really assiduous about your lawn. It works okay in residential settings. And that is just accept imperfection, okay? Um, stop using fertilizer fertilizers and chemicals. Let your lawn go dormant in the summer um, and, bet, and don't water it, you know, maybe once every two weeks, water it, keep it, keep it going. Mow it high with a mulching mower so you're returning all those nutrients. And this is my motto. And this is my backyard, okay? <laughs> I planted white clover in there and I planted some fine fescues and there's some other stuff. Um, but if it's green, I mow it. If it's crabgrass, I mow it. If it's a dandelion, I mow it. And so um, I realize this is not acceptable to a lot of people who want to have a beautiful lawn. But if you don't care that much, it is uh, pretty easy to put some white clover in there with your grass seed and that'll provide nitrogen and then you can just mow it and it'll be really great. Um, that's not, I'm not gonna say anything more about that approach. The, um, what I'm mostly gonna talk about is to find a substitute for lawn 
that sort of fills the same niche, but is climate friendly. And this is what I've been working on recently, and I call it the lawn mimic. Looks like lawn, but it, it, it doesn't have the bad attributes. So the lawn mimic, okay, the lawn mimic, um, they are meant to maintain the look of lawn without all the inputs and with less mowing. So a lawn mimic is defined as a mix of low and slow growing grasses, fine fescues, so they are not native, they're introduced, but we are working on some uh, mixes that include a few native species that don't grow very high. Um, so you uh, make a mix of these fine fescues and you can add micro clover, which is a smaller version of white clover, which doesn't have as many blossoms, which I think is important to a lot of people because people tell me they worry about bee stings. Um, if you're not worried about bee stings, you can put white clover in. It's a lot cheaper and easier to get. Um, the idea with the lawn mimics, and I will point out that this, these two really beautiful pictures come from a Howard County gardener, David Alexander. Um, I don't know if he's a master gardener or not, but he put um, fine fescue and micro clover in his yard and then he made this nice edge of just micro clover. So the reason to add the clover, of course, is because clover fixes nitrogen, that is it takes nitrogen out of the air and turns it into essentially fertilizer in the soil and the, uh, the lawn, the grass can pick that up and so you don't have to fertilize. So no fertilizer or chemicals, about 10 to 20% as much mowing, which is huge, right? If you could reduce all that fuel use and all those emissions to 10 or 20%, it'd be great. So that's around, you know, up to 80% less carbon dioxide emissions and some carbon sequestration. Some of these lawn mimics have roots that go down maybe, I don't know, a foot. Um, this is a little area along my driveway um, where I planted, I overseeded, because this was just a bog, there was really not very much grass here. I overseeded in the fall last year and again in the spring, and uh, the fine fescue mix came up, and I think it looks pretty good. And um, this is about, I mowed it about five inches, and this is the, about two weeks after that. The fine fescues grow up a little taller, but then they sort of flop over. Now, uh, again, from afar, I think it still looks fine. If you're, you know, want a nice cut lawn, you'd have to cut it. Um, but again, only um, maybe three or four times a summer. Um, okay, so um, golf course people, it turns out, have been experimenting with fine fescues for quite a while. But uh, the idea of using them as a way to reduce carbon emissions in landscaping really hasn't sort of penetrated, certainly the climate, um, the climate conversation. And um, together with um, the um, open space operations manager of Columbia Association, Nick Mooneyhan, and Julie Casentino, who is the B City person from Howard County, um, I applied for and we were awarded a Howard County Innovation Grant this past year. And we are testing, doing some experimental field trials of four different lawn mimic mixes. Two of them contain a native grass as one component. And we're doing two kinds of trials. One, we're planting these mixes on bare ground so we can see what they look like, um, you know, when they're not trying to grow through something else. Um, and so this is uh, this is in my sort of back uh, part of my property. Um, and we made these plots. We took off the sod and. Um, and then I planted them with these mixes. So there's several copies of each mix and um, uh, and in several copies of each mix in sun and in shade. Okay, so here are the shade plots. We, this is all planted now. Um, this is 60% shade, shade cloth, so it shades this. And um, this is what the plots look like about um, a month ago. Uh, after we um, we had to uh, we had to spray some herbicide because we had an enormous weed problem. Now, in retrospect, I'm thinking, why didn't I realize that? Because this used to be a pasture that I had abandoned and didn't do anything with except mow a few times a year. So it has just a gigantic amount of weed seeds in the seed bank. And so of course the weeds just came right up as soon as, um, as, soon as we exposed bare soil. 
And so the chief lesson so far is that site preparation, if you're going to have bare ground, you've got to um, get rid of the weeds a couple of times uh, after they first germinate. And um, then you can plant so that you don't have so much competition from weeds. However, I'm happy to say that even with the weed, all the weeds, um, the fine fescue is struggling along underneath. So in some cases, I've read that in the second year, it comes back better. Um, but I, I feel like, well, OK, I learned something, but I'm, we're still not ready for prime time on this. Um, the second thing we're doing, and I ha uh, the, you're wondering, why are you doing this at your house? I had to do these at my house because we had planned. We have um, sites that were uh, that we're allowed to work on in the Columbia Association and in Howard County, but we couldn't go there and work together because of the shutdown at the beginning of the summer. So we're hoping to put in our real trials in the fall, um, in the next month or so, for the grasses anyway. And um, I thought, well, maybe I can learn something by doing some trials at my house. So that's what I did. Um, so. Uh, the other part of the lawn part of the innovation grant is overseeding. So in most cases, there's already lawn there. And in order to um, do the lawn mimic thing, we have to ask the question, can we convert a current turf grass stand to lawn mimics by overseeding? Okay, so that means essentially um, uh, giving an opportunity for the lawn mimic seed to come up in an existing lawn. And in order to do that, uh, this is again along my driveway, closer down to the street. Um, I cut the grass, not short enough, and I core aerated it. So core aerator pulls up little cores and exposes, sort of roughs up the surface. And I put my seed mixes along here. And my neighbors are wondering, what the heck are these little flags along the driveway? And the UPS guy runs them over, but OK. Anyway, um, the benefits of this is that we could, uh, if we could um, oversee, probably have to do it a couple of times, you know, maybe three years even. Um, but if we could oversee and get the fine fescue mixes to uh, sort of take over the existing turf grass stands, then we could really convert the thing to a low maintenance landscape without really anybody even knowing, <laughs> which I think would be great. Um, and it would transform this mode open space into something that would be low maintenance, yet keep that look. Okay, so there's, you know, we wouldn't turn everything into a prairie meadow, which would, you know, I'd love to have prairie meadows on 4,000 acres, but that's not very likely, right? People aren't going to accept that. Um, so we could transform the, the mode open space to a low, low input and low mow area, but keep that same look. The benefits of overseeding, again, as, as compared to the standard status quo I described, no fertilizer or chemicals, up to 80% less mowing. The cost would be potentially reduced, and this is after we get it established, from $2,000 an acre to maybe $400 or $600 an acre for a gigantic savings for Howard County based on that 4,000 acres. And a huge reduction, you know, up to an 80% reduction of emissions from mowing. Um, and, um, you know, I've learned something so far, that, which is I didn't, um, I didn't cut the existing turf low enough, and um, I, I didn't do a lot of other things I could have done to suppress the growth of the existing turf and let the lawn mimic um, grasses grow up. So um, site preparation is another, you know, is the big thing here too. So I did learn something by this, uh, this from this little experiment at my, at my house that I think will be very helpful to us. Um, but, you know, it's a process. These things take time. Um, now, the second thing that I want to talk about um, is uh, increasing the use of native perennials in landscape beds, um, making these beds bigger and using perennials, native perennials, instead of annuals. So, you know, here's a very familiar picture of, you know, any Home Depot in the spring um, filled with these flats of beautiful annuals all blooming perfectly, um, all planted in plastic pot, you know, pot things. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forget what to call them. They're not pots because they're not individual, but they're little uh, pot flats filled with peat-based mix. And so they're really not very environmentally sound because although you can recycle these plastic things, most people don't. They just throw them away. 
and they buy these things every year, right? Um, so compared to using only annuals, if we put perennials in, it would save resources and time, and it would reduce the carbon footprint because we wouldn't have these single-use plastics and we wouldn't be using, you know, repeatedly the peat, which is um, not very climate friendly for various reasons. If we put in native perennials, it would increase pollinators and the biodiversity, which is what we want. If we put these native perennials in, they would sequester carbon because they're deep rooted. And you can go back and look at that slide I showed initially where some of the uh, purple cone flower, I think the roots only go down five feet, but some of the grasses and other, um, uh, other flowers, the roots go down maybe 10 or even 15 feet. Um, they, these plants sequester carbon, which means they store carbon in the soil, which is great. They take carbon out of the atmosphere for photosynthesis and store it in the soil. That's good. It keeps it out of the atmosphere. Um, it also, they also improve the soil, add organic material, etc. And by doing that, they increase a water infiltration from rain and help manage storm stormwater. And they can be used in a lot of different settings. Um, so this is a really beautiful meadow. Somebody put it in a park. You can plant these um, native plants um, in, you know, little patches in urban settings. Uh, this is um, Elvia Thompson's um, um, Annapolis Green headquarters, where she's got a nice native garden in the front of that. This is a ferry terminal, a picture I got from um, National Park Service. So you can put these plants in beds in a lot of different places. Um, and they can be planted at any scale from a meadow behind a new community, okay? And actually, this is, this is really a, a wonderful story. I, I would love to see this happen more. Um, this is from a book from Catherine Zimmerman. Where's my mouse? Catherine Zimmerman published in 2010 about meadows. And she describes how the presence of this meadow in the back was a real selling point for these houses because it helped manage the stormwater and reduce their costs for mowing, okay? So they loved it. Uh, and again, it's all on how you sell it, right? Um, this is a, a condo complex, and this is Julie Casentino's um, front yard. She put in a little planting of, uh, this is very early in the season, so you can't see many flowers, of native um, perennials here and up by the house. And she did a really good job of, of setting it apart, making it look very intentional. That's a really important thing with these native plants is you, you don't necessarily want it to look um, all um, sort of unruly and um, the neighbors like it better if it looks intentional. Um, this is the side view of um, Annapolis Green Headquarters. You can put these plants in raised beds, you can grow them in pots. I mean, the pollinators are gonna come to the pots or the raised beds, just like they would come to anything planted in the ground. So um, you can put them in a small area, you don't have to have a great big space, or you could put them in you know, large spaces in an HOA. Um, now, how are you going to establish a meadow or a pollinator bed? If you plant, want to plant a meadow from seed, I would put this in the category of not for the beginner, okay? Um, there have been zillions of very disappointed people who've had gotten a little packet of meadow seed and sprinkled it around and not a thing, single thing has come up. Um, if you're going to plant a meadow like this, a big area, you know, I would say bigger than maybe 200 square feet, um, it requires a lot of site prep because you've got to get rid of the weeds um, uh, that are going to germinate before you plant this stuff. And most of these large things are planted with big equipment, right, and cedars. Um, if you just sprinkle stuff out there without doing a lot of big serious site prep, you really don't know not only what's going to germinate, but you're going to probably going to have a lot of weeds. And the other thing is when you have a new meadow, you need to maintain it. And one way you maintain it is by mowing it every year. And the first year you mow it five inches and the second year you mow it a little higher because different plants have started to enter the community. Um, and you know, once you get even five inches is too big for most lawnmowers. So uh, it can be a little bit challenging. I'm not saying you should never think about doing it, but Again, this is like removing your lawn. You have to be a really, really uh, excited gardener to, to be able to manage these challenges. Um, so most people around a home for a small area would plant a, um, a sort of meadow. Uh, that just means native plants um, 
not in pots, um, from plants or plugs. Plugs are just small, you know, are plants in, you know, uh, flat that might have 30 holes or something like that. If you have um, plants or plugs, you can control the composition better. Okay, you're not just tossing some seed out there and thinking, well, what's going to germinate? Um, and a meadow is typically about 40% grasses and 60% forbs. So a forb is what you would think of as one of these flowering plants. Grasses, of course, are flowering plants. They're just wind pollinated, so they don't have showy flowers. Um, but the grasses, the native grasses are, can be very beautiful for one thing and um, are also very important for the biodiversity angle because many organisms use those grasses uh, for habitat or, um, or whatnot. You still need to worry about weeds in between the plugs if you plant it you know, in an uh, open space like this behind a house. So this is part of our Howard County Innovation Grant is that we are trying to de devise some strategies for weed-free perennial beds. Um, according to my reading, the need to frequently hand weed these pollinator beds is a deterrent to a lot of people, um, maybe not so much in the residential landscape, but definitely in the municipal landscape, uh, because they don't want to allocate labor to going out to hand weed. So what we're doing in our innovation grant this year, well, we're, we're starting it this year, um, is field trials of several weed reduction strategies. And um, we have reduced this to three. We've eliminated this one, although it's a good idea. Um, so we have just the plugs planted in bare soil, okay? Our plots are four foot by six foot. So we have just the, pl the plugs, so these are the little cartoons. We have the plugs and then um, we uh, interceded, that is we scattered red clover seeds around in between the plugs and the red clover germinates very quickly. And um, you have to weed it a little bit till the red clover plants get larger, but they cr the purpose is, is for them to crowd out the weeds and they also produce flowers that are useful for pollinators. So you're not really setting yourself back. Um, another thing we wanted to do was to intercede with violets, which is a native ground cover, which would fill in and again, outcompete the weeds. But we were not able to find a commercial source of violets. And although you can dig them up pretty much anywhere, I probably have 2 billion in my yard. It's not really, you know, you can't say, well, okay, everybody who wants to do this can come to my yard and dig up violets, although I guess I wouldn't really mind. Um, and the, the last treatment is to roll out this horticultural paper, which is about the thickness of a paper bag. And it, it, it comes in rolls that are four feet wide by 100 feet long. And so our, just conveniently, our plots are four feet wide. So I just rolled out a piece of this paper and cut it off. And we planted the plugs right through the paper. Okay, and the idea is the paper is going to inhibit the weed germination in between where the plants are growing. So we only have a little area right around where the plug went in where we might get some weeds. And so um, I'll show you what this looks like. Again, this is, um, this is in my backyard. Um, I, I wanna point out this tool. This is a life altering tool. I forget what it's called. <laughs> uh, the pro plugger maybe, I don't know. The idea of it is it makes these little holes which are three inches in diameter. And you can put these little rings on here to make them varying depth. The deepest is five inches and you can put a ring to stop it at two inches. Um, and so um, these are the plots. We had, um, there's six of the plots, four on the side and two here. We had two copies of each of three treatments, the bare ground, the paper, and the, um, and the clover. And um, this is what they look like after they were all planted. And the bare ground and the clover, I prepared the plots by just uh, measuring out where I needed a plug and do, doing this. No crouching with this tool, which is a bonus, right? No crouching. And the great thing is you can just stamp it down, you know, maybe six or seven times and the plugs go up in here and then you dump it out. So it's very fast to, uh, make an array of holes. And then you just fill in with a little extra dirt so your plug is all happy. Um, this is the paper treatment where uh, I did this two ways. The first time I made the holes and then laid the paper out and then 
Um, I'm sorry, the first time I laid the paper out and then made the holes and that turned out to be a pain because the, the paper ripped with this thing. So then I made the holes and laid the paper out and then cut a little X right over each hole and put the, the plug in. That worked great. This is, um, this is what the plots look like, I think about five weeks after we planted them. Um, and now they're even bigger. Um, and uh, we planted the plants on six inch centers, which we decided are a little too close, but um, they, the, pl the plots filled up really fast. Okay, um, so what about weeding? Here's a bare ground plot. Um, again, I put these in an old pasture, and so the crabgrass came up in about five minutes after we planted, and it was really fierce in the bare ground plots, okay? And so it took me uh, two hours and 20 minutes to weed this bare ground plot. Um, if you can believe it, there are a lot of native plants in there. You just can't see them because there's so much crabgrass. Um, in the plots where I planted through the paper, this is an average of two hours, 20 minutes for the two bare ground plots. And four weeks later, it looks pretty good. Not that many more weeds grew. Um, here's the plot with the paper. Um, I really love this, okay? I, I, I have to tell you that I'm really excited about this because it took me only 45 minutes to weed these, even though it was right next, one of them was right next to this and had a lot of crabgrass coming up in the little holes I had to weed, but all the places where there's paper, no crabgrass came up. Four weeks later, I think this plot looks even better. I don't have any quantitative measurements of that. Um, and uh, you can see that in, in one of the plots, we actually um, uh, folded the paper back so that it came back in contact with the plant. And you can see there's just not that much space where, where the weeds can come up, okay? And that really helped a lot. So I love this. Four foot wide by 100 foot long means you could lay out a, um, you can lay out a, uh, a big bed without too much trouble. Okay, now native perennials, there are a few issues. Um, and uh, one of them is it can be hard to find native plants for purchase or landscapers who plant the natives. Um, I had a little resource list I sent out when I first gave this webinar. I, I'll try to find that. It's easy to start these plants from seed, and that's what I did for the ones I did in my yard. I started in um, January and seeded a bunch of plug flats under lights at my house and um, it was easy, really easy. I grew s over 650 plants and repotted them from these plug flats into two inch pots and then we put them outside. It was easy. Um, then there's the issue of where are you gonna get the seed from? Are you gonna worry about whether you have a local ecotype or not? Now, there's a lot of controversy about this and I'll just tell you right now that um, before I started doing this climate outreach work. Um, I spent 35 years as an evolutionary biologist. And um, so I, in fact, worked on ecotypes and in insects. So I, I feel I have some degree of knowledge about this, although it's not for plants. So the question is, are locally adapted plants, that is plants that come from a particular area, better or more natural to have than just genotypes from someplace else that you might buy. So if you go to a seed company and you just buy a, a pollinator mix, um, uh, then you, you, you might get different ecotypes. Now, if you go to Ernst Seeds, which is a big, you know, Ernst Conservation Seed, they are really big on ecotypes. And so you can get, um, this is a native pollinator mix. It has a lot of grasses in there. The Virginia wild rye is a Pennsylvania ecotype. Um, the partridge pea is a Pennsylvania ecotype. The rest of these are just generalized. Um, Black-eyed Susan, coastal plain, North Carolina ecotype. Well, is that gonna do well when I plant it in Maryland? All these Pennsylvania ecotypes. Well, Pennsylvania is pretty close to Maryland, but um, you know, it's not exactly Maryland. It's not exactly where we're gonna plant the things. And here's the um, sort of evolutionary point of view. Um, the idea, uh, that people have is that if you bring um, a genotype of um, 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 some kind of black-eyed Susan, say, from Missouri to and plant it in Maryland. So I buy seeds from Roundtree Seeds and plant them in Maryland. 
um, that those are going to be maladapted to Maryland and they're going to bring in genes that are maladapted and they're not going to do very well. But the evolutionary point of view says also sometimes new genes from someplace else provide raw material for a burst of new adaptation on the spot. And I think that's important. So by no means is this a closed question, but I don't think it's obvious that we need to buy ecotypes from close by. Also, if you think of climate change, we really don't want to buy ecotypes from north of us because it's only getting warmer, right? So there's a, it's a complicated thing and you can get as lost in this as you want, but I'm going to get out of here before I get too much more in the weeds, so to speak. Um, if you put in pollinator plants like this, I'll just generally call them pollinator plants, native perennials that pollinators use, um, there's a lot of uh, both climate and watershed benefits. Um, you can use deep rooted native plants in swales like this down the middle of roads because roads are usually in the median, they're usually contoured so the water will flow down and there's drainage or whatnot. If you have a big bed running down the middle of a road like this, um, first of all, it reduces the amount of lawn to mow, but it also will help, it, it's like a little mini rain garden, it will help absorb the water because the water will infiltrate into the soil better when you have um, uh, deep rooted plants like that. Um, so it helps control flooding, it'll boost pollinators because there are going to be a lot of pollinators going onto these plants, and it will help sequester carbon. So climate uh, benefits from sequestering carbon, water benefits from controlling pollinator and uh, controlling flooding, and you know boosting pollinators is just a benefit. So you know here's a really nice cul-de-sac, and I think this is a, a town in Indiana where they planted native plants. This is a commercial uh, office park, it looks like, and they put a really nice rain garden in there. I would like to see a lot more of this, and I think if we could advertise a method like the paper. Um, where we could plant this, you know, maybe this is 300 feet long by, I don't know, 20 feet wide or something like that. So we just roll out the paper. I mean, it's work, right? But then the mowers don't have to go in there and you get all this watershed bonus and, and whatnot. So I would love to see this happen. Um, it, around um, residential areas where you have these catchment ponds, these are just a mess because all the fertilizer comes off of the lawn, goes into these ponds, and you can see it's growing a bunch of algae. It's really not a good situation. Um, in contrast, if you surround the pond with a meadow like this, and this is again from that book from Catherine Zimmerman, then these plants are intercepting a lot of the runoff and keeping it from getting into the pond. Um, and they're also helping um, uh, with water infiltration, so that helps with flooding. So um, this is a huge bonus, and it saves the homeowners a lot of money in mowing. This is a big bonus, but it takes a little bit of outreach to get most people familiar with the idea. Because when you say, I want to plant a pollinator meadow, a lot of people will think, that's going to look really ugly. That's going to look like my neighbor's place when they, do when they don't cut the grass. It's just going to look like a mess. But I think with a little bit of training and more understanding, people will see that these don't have to look messy, okay? Um, and, and also, people will understand their benefits, and that also helps. I mean, I think this looks a lot uglier than this, if, okay, if you, uh, if you compare these two. Okay, now, uh, I want to do a little diversion just for one second. Um, in Colombia and a lot of places in, in, in uh, inland Maryland, we have a lot of stream erosion, okay? Now this is a picture, I, I don't remember where this is from, but this is a picture where the stream bank is only about two feet high. So that in, you know, to Howard County, that's like, we, we don't have a problem here. But before you know it, this is going to be five feet high, 10 feet high. It's going to be really eroded down, okay? Because the stream comes whipping around here. The homeowner has mowed up to the edge. There's, you can see the root, where the roots are. There's no roots on this turf grass, right? And so there's nothing to hold the stream bank. The stream in a flood stage will just come whipping around here and it'll crumble, 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 and it'll eat this person's yard. So um, the idea is, first of all, 
do not mow to the edge. That is easy, right? You just say, stop mowing. Don't mow right to the edge. Let the grasses grow up. And what happens is if you stop mowing, perennial grasses, there's tons of grass seed flying around everywhere. Perennial grasses will come in and start to, I mean, native grasses will come in and start to grow there. And it will not look bad because you will have it mowed you know, uh, up to say six feet from the, from the boundary. And it'll just look like a little natural area. Um, uh, or you can uh, very intentionally plant some deep rooted grasses. And my current favorite is Virginia wild rye. It does okay. It's really attractive in the winter because it has these inflorescent stalks. So here's where the seeds grow and they turn brown and they stand up uh, all winter after the seeds have fallen out. They still look really beautiful. And it would be actually a very pretty boundary in the backyard. And um, a lot of nurseries grow plugs of this stuff. And um, I, I grow, grew some from seed last year, and I can attest to the fact that the roots grow really fast. I had, I didn't have as deep plugs as these, but the roots grew right out the bottom. I mean, and they started coiling around. So they were like two feet deep by the time I planted the plugs, if I uncoiled them. Um, so you could plant those along a stream and it would stabilize that and save Howard County and every other county from in four or five or 10 years coming back and having to do the serious stream rebuilding, which costs millions of dollars, right? If we nip it in the bud, well, nobody's worried about it. We don't have to do that. So I think that would be a bonus. Um, I think, I, can I go, I, go a few more minutes? I think we have uh, an hour and a half. Stephanie? Yeah, okay. yep, you're good to go. We are scheduled until three. Oh, oh, till three? Yeah. Oh, well, don't tell me that. I won't go that long. I want to answer. <laughs> okay. But um, I wanted to also bring up some other things you can do with beds in your yard if you take out the grass, okay? And I got a lot of inspiration from this um, book by a woman named Bree Arthur. Um, and I, of course, forgot what the name of the book is, uh, but it was published in, her name is B-R-E-E, -E, Arthur, um, in 2018. And um, the, she's not the only person talking about this idea of foodscaping, but the idea is to plant food in your landscape like it was an ornamental. And um, so she really takes this to extremes, which um, I think looks great, but I have to tell you that I would, I would forget where all my plants were. <laughs> Where were those eggplants, you know, and having everything mixed up with, you know, she's got some um, coleus and other things in here, but here's eggplants and tomato and another eggplant and, you know, some other stuff. Um, uh, here's a nice border. That's another thing is that you really keep your neighbors happy if you make your beds with perennials um, or native plants look intentional. That is, have a nice border. She plants wheat in her backyard, which is pretty cool. Um, and also oats, and these look beautiful. I mean, this, it looks like ornamental grasses. Um, so uh, she suggests um, to it, uh, create a, a neat edge, okay, a border, um, using herbs, uh, garlic, peanuts. Uh, she lives in North Carolina, so peanuts grow there. Although I've grown peanuts here, and they really are beautiful plants. Um, mix vegetables with uh, flowers behind the edge, okay? So you've got a nice edge. It's like this, they planned this, okay? And then you mix everything up back there. Um, she has, I don't think, I can't remember if I have a little picture of this, but she has a little sitting area where she has, um, instead of ornamental shrubs, she has blueberries and raspberries. Um, so she's used a lot of edible shrubs in the landscape, aronia, which are like blueberries, service berries, edible trees, hazelnut and fruit trees. And she replaced her ornamental grasses with, you know, uh, grains, which she har then harvests, which is kind of cool. Um, she uh, made a plan for her whole property. So again, this is again from her book. And so here's her house, here's the front yard. And you can see right off the bat that she planned the beds to have a pleasing shape, you know, curves like landscape. I mean, it looks beautiful, right? Landscape designer. So she's got these nice symmetrical curves and, um, and yet she's planted edible stuff in here, okay? Um, so lay out a pleasing array of beds with just a little bit of lawn, could be a lawn mimic, in between here. Here's your driveway, I guess. Um, 
plant tree, uh, she describes how you plant trees, shrubs, and perennials as a permanent scaffold, okay? So they're gonna come up every year, the trees and shrubs are there. And then you can plant annual vegetables in amongst them. Uh, uh, seasonally as you know as you uh, as you wish um, and so uh, I heard her give a podcast and she uh, said she put this all in her neighborhood in North Carolina and then she said that she won a prize in her neighborhood for the most beautiful landscaping and she kind of said you know uh, off the cuff you know I don't think my neighbors even knew that there were vegetables in there <laughs> You know, most people don't know what vegetable plants look like. So, um, you know, not that she was trying to get away with anything, but the point is she made it look really beautiful and that's a bonus. Um, and also she reduced her, yard, her lawn by, you know, at least 50%. Um, another thing, another vision for like a development is that you can progressively reduce the turf grass uh, in among a group of houses. So let's say here we've got a, a typical suburban development. We've got a house, a lot of lawn, a few trees, okay? Landscaping around the foundation, that's typical. Well, the first thing that people say is, is start around the edges, you know, using the trees and around, in, you know, around your property line and, and make a bed and that you can sort of expand. So you can, whoops, you can start I'm sorry, I did not mean to click that. Oh boy, oh boy, stand by. You can make a, uh, start with a bed around a tree. You could make a bed around each of these trees and make them bigger and bigger and just have a meet, you know, as, as your time permits and put in some ground covers and some other stuff in there, leaving just a small area of lawn around the house, you know, for your barbecue or your kids to play or whatever. Um, and then if you're working with your neighbors, uh, ideally you'd have all of them doing this until the whole neighborhood has a lot of contiguous trees and this is one of those neighborhoods where there's no fencing in between um, a lot of contiguous trees and it's really a great habitat for wildlife and um, insects that are beneficial okay most insects are beneficial and, and if you give uh, uh, insects and beneficial animals habitat, then they will come and live there and then you won't have as many non-beneficial animals. Um, and this is very good for the soil, for water management, et cetera. I would love to see this kind of thing become the norm instead of you know this with that big algae filled catchment pond in the back. Um, Okay, uh, you may or may not know that your landscaping is um, a very good way to reduce energy use in your home. Um, if you plant evergreens on the north side or the windy side, so this is like this, okay? These are, wait, these are deciduous. I don't have a picture of that. Oh, north side, evergreen, where the wind is blowing, they can block the wind. So that wind, of course, is whistling through your house, even if it's well, well sealed, it still uh, uses power because it cools the outside of the house. Deciduous trees on the south and west side. So here's that picture. Um, this is the south side where the sun is cycling over. Um, and in summer, the tree shades the house, right? Because the leaves are on it. In the winter, the leaves fall off. And so the sun can come and warm the house. So that's great. Um, if you do these things, you can save about 20% on your air conditioning. If you have shade on your air conditioning unit, or if your builder was smart enough to put the air conditioning unit on the north side, um, you can save a lot more on your air conditioning. I have a heat pump, like most people around in Maryland, I, I think, and it cools by exchanging the heat from the inside, which is, it seems improbable, but it's, it, it works. Um, but my um, uh, heat pump is sitting out there in the sun. It gets really hot. So the metal was just like really hot. And I tried to grow some trees, but you know, it takes a while and I didn't get enough overhang. So I put up a beach umbrella on a stand and I tilted it so that it would shade the HVAC unit. Now you have to be very careful not to interfere with the airflow coming out of the top right key. But I shaded it and then the surface of the thing was cool to the touch. And so I wasn't able to measure exactly how much I saved, but I know I must have saved something because it wasn't fighting this, you know, solar um, 
uh, gain on the on the um, on the uh, HVAC unit. Shrubs around the foundation, not really close. You don't want to have it really close because rodents and stuff. But a little bit away from your foundation will also reduce reduce heat loss. Now. What if you want to uh, do something in your yard that is, you know, going to be like put in a meadow or something, and you have to work with your neighbors and the homeowner association, the local government, and in Howard County there have been some nasty situations where you know one or two people in a homeowner association has made a big deal about someone putting native plants in their front yard and it's become just a awful thing awful divisive issue um, so before you start it's probably worth knowing the rules and weighing your options you know what are the rules does it does the, your homeowner association say you every front lawn has to be grass and nothing else or what um, make your yard fit in with the neighbors uh, now the yard that I'm thinking of was beautiful and she, this woman had beautiful beds, but the person was adamant that anything that looked like, you know, that wasn't an annual with weed cloth, et cetera, and bark was messy. But one thing you can do, first of all, you could use a lawn mimic and you could put a lawn mimic in there and nobody would even know it wasn't a regular lawn. And the other thing is you can make it look intentional. So this, this, for example, this person has got a nice little edge of lawn. She's got a curved border, so it looks really intentional, mows right up to the edge. And so it looks like somebody planned this. You can put other, these are called cues to care. In other words, somebody's paying attention. You can clear edge, you can add um, yard accessories like a bird bath. You can keep it tidy, right? So don't let it look over all overgrown. That'll make the neighbors a lot happier. Um, share your vision even before you do it and your design with the neighbors um, and maybe to the board, right? Reach out to your homeowner board um, and or the local government, depending on, on who's in charge, with information about the environmental value and the cost savings of your plan to the neighborhood. And start small, right? maybe start in the backyard, okay? This is a process and it takes time to get people's ideas changed from everybody has got this expanse of mowed grass to people have things that look a little different. And so I would just like to encourage you uh, that when you, I know all of you go out and work with people, when you encourage people for watershed purposes or for pollinator purposes to put in uh, native plants, uh, Make sure that you that they know that they'll have better success if they make it look tidy and that it might take some time. But the point is, be enthusiastic, be persistent and stay positive. OK, the person I'm thinking of in this homeowner association forged through and um, managed to this is not her fault. This is like that would be like victim blaming. But her her neighbors did not support her as well as they could have. And so be enthusiastic, be persistent, and stay positive, okay? Um, now, there's some really nice case studies. Um, uh, one, uh, a person I know in Howard County um, uh, heard one of my talks and decided she wanted to, her townhome community to do something. And I didn't know this was happening until she emailed me like the day they were putting it in. And so this is an area that the, she went to talk to her board about the environmental and ecological benefits of reducing the amount of mowed grass. And she, they thought that sounded pretty useful to consider. And so they told her she could have this little corner for a demonstration, okay? So it's pretty typical right now. It's got a little, a little hedge of some trim shrubs and mowed grass and it's all nice and neat right around the sidewalk. And, um, Jean researched her options and made a plan and worked with the landscapers. The landscapers put this thing in and they're maintaining it. And she planted, um, let me just talk about this. And so they came up with a plan, which I think looks really great. There's some native grasses back here. There's a few other native plants. Now, this is the way most people will, will want to start. And that is that the board understands this. So we've got some pine bark mulch here. We've got little plants sort of pretty far apart. Maybe it's like 15 or 20 inches apart. It's gonna take a while to fill in. 
Um, and you know, it's all looks designed and nice. The landscaping company brought in these two wooden, like, uh, I think they're logs or something for seats and also this nice seat. And then there's this little public lending library that they put in. So it's a little gathering area with a slightly different color of mulch or something <coughs> to look like a path. So it all looks really nice, right? Now, if you are thinking, I want to have masses of pollinator plants, then this might not look all that great to you. But this is a really good step where the landscapers are going to maintain this. It's going to look nice. Jane can take people. There's going to be pollinators in there, butterflies next year, et cetera. And this is a toe in the door, okay? Because this looks like a, um, uh, a neighborhood of large houses where people don't have a lot of landscaping. It's mostly grass. So you got to start somewhere. So Jane did this, I think, just right. Her board also gave her an out of the way place where she could plant some pollinator beds, okay? And um, she plans to expand that next year. She planted little squares, she's gonna make them curve, she's gonna put in more native plants. And you know, she's starting small, she's building on it. And I think she did it just right because she can take her neighbors and they'll see how all the good things are unfolding. Um, so uh, I'm gonna end there. Um, I just want to say that I think we can manage our suburban landscapes better than we're doing now um, in ways that will reduce emissions, store carbon, increase biodiversity, save a ton, <clears throat> a ton of time and money. And um, again, I'll refer you to these are actually landscapes that individuals that I know put in at their houses, and I think they look absolutely great. So um, let me see. I think I might have one. Uh, Wait oh, I just, yeah, I'm going to send out a copy of a handout of the slides. And I just wanted to highlight um, some books that I used that I thought were good. They're not, I don't agree with everything in every book, but there's a lot of good ideas and great pictures. This is the book by Catherine Zimmerman uh, that I included. I mentioned a number of pictures. Um, okay, and then there's a various other ideas in here. Um, okay, so I'll just end on here. And maybe we could take some questions. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Thanks so much. So um, I'm going to go back and just kind of go through the questions as we, as we have received them throughout the presentation. So if you guys have questions that you didn't send in, go ahead and send those in now so we can get to those. Um, so the first one, we had a lot of great comments, actually, as you were talking, people were chiming in, which is really excellent. This um, is why I love talking to Master Gardeners, because yes. you know, there's so much enthusiasm. Absolutely. Yeah, there was. Um, so one of the questions we got uh, was, does the lawnmower usage include battery operated mowers? And that was back when you're giving the statistics. at the. Oh, no, no, it doesn't. Okay. Um, uh, if you have an electric mower, uh, obviously you have to charge the battery, but just like electric cars, mm -hmm. it's still more efficient to have the electric mower. And electric mowers are great. Um, I have an electric mower in addition to my, well, I have a kind of a on uh, out of control property here, but uh, I have an electric mower as well as my tractor and um, I really like it. Uh, so yeah, electric mowers are great. Okay. And someone did put just as a comment that you can still buy um, an old fashioned real mower where you, you push and then it turns the blade without having any type of motor. So. Yay. Yeah, just I mean, that's great if you don't have very much lawn. Right. It's good <laughs> exercise and it's really great. I mean, I remember, as I said, I remember my dad, we had a minuscule yard, um, probably mm -hmm. a, a quarter acre lot or something, but there are a lot of places where there's not that much yard and yeah. it would be great to have a push mower. Mm -hmm. um, okay, someone was asking if there was any um, tie into the degradation of the Asian, Asian jumping worms that are depleting soil of nutrients and they have them in their area in northern Baltimore County. The Asian what? The Asian jumping worms. I am clueless <laughs> about Asian jumping worms. I'm sorry. Okay. I, know. Yeah, I, mean, I, know. I didn't even know. I'll have to look them up now. I yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> um okay where can you buy micro clover? Um well it's not that easy to get. Uh I started last year and um, I um, sometimes I order uh, native grass seed or regular uh, large amounts of seed from Hancock Seed and they sell micro clover, but they were out. So I wound up last fall buying some from um, Amazon from a 
um, a company called Outside Pride. Uh, and I think they call it Mini Clover. Now, um, let me warn you that when Mini Clover is in a really good spot, it grows pretty big, okay? And it, it, has, uh, it has subflowers, but probably not as many as white clover, but it is a lot more expensive. And so if you are not worried about bees, and in fact, you know, white clover is good for bees, um, I would put plant white clover in my yard. Well, I did, but, um, but if you're worried about bees, you can plant micro clover. And Outside Pride uh, it sells it on their own website or you can buy it through Amazon. Okay. Um, we had a request for you to change your slide back to the books slide so folks can see those titles again. Thank you. Wait, wait, uh, let me find it. There we are. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. And we had someone, a pretty good suggestion, try to reduce your lawn by one foot each year. Just do it slowly over time. Yeah, that's great. So just make the beds bigger. Mm -hmm. Expand the beds. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, it's kind of daunting to uh, yeah. do these big lawn renovation projects. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, what about strategies to get rid of pernicious perennial weeds like wild violet and quack grass? <laughs> that's a new one for me. Well, I don't think of wild violet as a pernicious weed. Um, I think of it as a native plant that flowers and it, I've got a lot of it in my yard. I mean, it, it, it's not evergreen, so you don't have it in the winter, but I really find the blooms in the spring beautiful. It's all naturalized in my yard. Um, there are a lot of pernicious perennial weeds and you know various grasses like the quack grass and other grasses and um, uh, like Rumex and all those. Other, I, I, I don't know how, I mean, I really don't know how to get rid of them except to just keep pulling them up. I, otherwise, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, back in the day, you could zap them with Roundup, but nobody wants to do that. And, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Okay. Um, what native plant plugs did you use in your experimental weed-free perennial beds? Um, I, um, I think I mentioned this after I showed that I grew the native plants myself from seed in plug flats, and it's shockingly easy. Uh, I just filled up a, like a 72 or a 90 well plug flat with potting soil. And mm -hmm. then I took the, you know, native, the pollinator mix and just went, next time I'm going to mix it with sand like they recommend for you when you're, when you're mm -hmm. broadcasting outside because I got too many plants in each, in each plug. Yeah. But I didn't think I'd get anything, right? And um, it turns out most of the plants in the mix will germinate at at least a low frequency without some special treatment. And so if you're just doing like this, you're getting putting down a lot of seeds, you're gonna get some of even the rarest ones germinating and you're gonna get yeah. a lot of the other ones. So I used the um, Howard County pollinator mix that they got from Ernst. Mm -hmm. and it has blue stem and a bunch of other stuff in it. Um, I also used a pollinator mix that I got from Round Tree Seed in Missouri, and um, it was also really great. Uh, when a lot of things came up in the plug, then uh, when I was transplanting, I would just take the plugs out and gently separate the plants, and maybe I'd get five pots out of one of the plugs if there were a lot of plants that turned wow. If you've got racks and lights, you can yeah. start them up in January and you'll, you'll be ready to go uh, in the fall. Yeah. And that way you don't have to try to find the plants. You don't have to pay for them because um, uh, if you buy plugs commercially, they're really expensive. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I think Julie Constantino is buying some for our fall experiment and, and wholesale. She's paying $2 each, which is not too bad, mm -hmm. but still, I mean, I got 600 <laughs> out of just, you know, a little bit of work. Yeah. And I had to buy a bunch of two inch pots and I have, you know, I have a bunch of racks and lights, but um, mm -hmm. it's not that big an investment. If you're not already starting your own seeds for your garden, um, it's, it's uh, more sustainable to start your own seeds because you can use, you can reduce the amount of peat you use in your mix and it's mm -hmm. a lot cheaper if you've got the stuff to do it, so. Yeah, excellent. Very good, great advice. Um, does sufficient water get through the craft paper? I think oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Um, uh, I don't know if people came to my gardening webinar, but I also used that paper in my garden. And I've got some long rows, like 50 foot rows. And I just rolled out this paper four feet wide by 50 feet long. And um, if, if you're interested in this, you can go back to the video that's on the HGIC site and you'll see how I, to plant beans, I just cut little, um, sort of strips out of the paper and planted the beans in the strips. And it really worked. I couldn't believe it. It really worked and wow. kept the weeds down. And that I put, uh, I put drip, um, what do you call it? Soaker hose underneath the paper. Mm -hmm. And so it was just like, no fuss, no muss. Yeah. And now the paper's starting to deteriorate. So um, it's all, you know, recycling. Excellent. Very good. Um, when you talked about working with HOA, as someone wanted to know, was the landscaping in the HOA community paid for by the community? Yep. Well, it always is. Yeah. Okay. It's paid for by their fees. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, they, again, talk about not thinking about it though, right? You pay your fee and you, then you see the lawnmower guys and you don't connect. Oh, if they didn't mow the lawn, have to mow the lawn as much, it would save me a lot of money. But that's how this, in this Catherine Zimmerman book, the um, developers or somebody sold it to the residents as being a cost-saving measure to have mm -hmm. that area around that catchment pond put into a meadow. Yeah. So it's just like, well, you know, exactly. are you just going to stay with the same old, same old? Or are you going to try something new, but then you have to teach people? Sure. Um, what are the plants in David Alexander's photo? Oh, um, uh, fine fescue mix and micro clover. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, how do you deal with deer in very large shady areas? Um, fine fescue loves the shade. The clover, not so much. The micro clover did okay in the shade. I think white clover wants a little bit more sun. Deer, uh, you know, I... I finally hit the wall with deer this year and um, because they were coming into my garden and they ate my strawberries and they ate my beans and they, you know, it was like every night and I try to cover. I, do, I finally decided I was going to put up deer fence and I, mm -hmm. I put up actual, I already have a four foot wide wire mesh fence around my whole, four foot high, around my whole three acre property. It's, it's uh, semi-rural, right? So, um, uh, you know, posts with wire in between. And so I bought some three foot high stakes like you'd use in a garden. Mm -hmm. And I screwed these into the posts and they're 20 feet apart. And then I put um, some deer mesh in between that. Well, then I realized that actually the deer could hardly see that anyway. And so I had to put some, I put a row of uh, a little uh, length of flagging tape along the top, okay, seven feet from the ground. Then I realized, well, you know, I could just put the flagging tape in between the stakes. <laughs> and so I didn't even buy any more deer fence. I just put the stakes all the way around my whole property and, and stretch flagging tape in between. And the deer are like, I'm not going to jump over that. <laughs> the fence, and then they see something way up there. And they're like, I don't know what that is. But yeah. I've been, you know, looking, I've been checking the perimeter every morning because you can, mm -hmm. if you can come through there, right, it's going to break the flagging tape. And uh, I had one incident the first night. And then after that, okay. no more. And now my, everything is secure. <laughs> There's no more deer. So if you live in a neighborhood, I don't know if you're, if you're, if your people would like that. <laughs> Got it. Um, okay, next question. Can you address the role of shade trees in carbon sequestration and water filtration? What was that word? Can you do what with the shade trees? Can you address the role of shade trees? Adjust them? Address. Uh, address. I'm sorry. No worries. Uh, I'm embarrassed. I forgot to put my hearing aids in. And, it, and, I, and so I'm, you know, I, it really is stinks to be old. Let me tell you, you can't hear very well. Um, address the role of trees. Trees are the best way to sequester carbon because you've got all this carbon in the wood right? And then you got a lot of carbon in the roots. And I mean, it takes time to grow, but trees, if you want to um, do something in your yard, 
to um, address climate change in addition to you can reduce the lawn, but you can put in a lot more trees. And um, uh, trees are great. And then address the lawn mimic, is that what you said? Um, the, also the role of shade trees in water filtration. Water filtration. Um, well, uh, the trees help soak up the water, right? So that's good. And um, the roots also make the soil more, um, uh, sort of improve the health of the soil and so that you get better infiltration. And so trees are just good. Now you don't want to plant them next to your septic tank because the roots are, you know, can be, the roots can really grow and be damaging. You don't want to plant them too close to your house, um, et cetera. But uh, other than that, trees are great. Yeah. And the fine fescues just rock in the shade. So um, you don't have to worry about that. Great. Um, are there any methods or literature on how to kill weed seeds in existing soil prior, prior to overseeding? Oh, without getting rid of the grass? Um, well, uh, here's what we're going to do uh, in the fall in our overseeding trials. You can put down broadleaf herbicide. That's not going to kill grass. And um, what we're going to do, okay, let me preface this by saying nothing is perfect, okay? So I have already accepted in my own mind that we're going to need to apply some herbicide when, to get these things going. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, um, uh, cut the grass really low so it kind of maims it, the existing grass, sort of scalp it. And then um, we're, uh, I, I, I might not have the order of this right. We might put the broadleaf herbicides down first and then cut the grass, I can't remember. Because if we cut down the weeds too short, they won't take up any herbicide. Um, uh, um, but then I think we're gonna have to probably um, herbicide a couple of times um, to keep the weeds out while the grass is establishing. I, heard, I listened to a webinar about fine fescues on golf courses and um, they, they basically said, when you're establishing these things, you have to herbicide them for the first year. I'm like, okay, because I don't want to use herbicide, but if I can use herbicide for six months or, you know, one season, one year, and then get lawn mimics so I don't have to mow or put down any fertilizer or any other chemicals, then that's mm -hmm. a good trade-off, right? Yeah. So it, that's why I said this is in the nothing is perfect category. Got it. Okay. Um, we have two questions. Both are asking about the best kind of plants to use in a swale. However, one of the folks who has this question um, lives where there's an HOA. So they want to know for the section of the swale that is kind of on the border of the property, um, are there good plants that could be used in a swale that are also okay kind of under, you know, oh. HOA property? Um, I'm not a big expert in that. Um, I think uh, the first question is whether in the swale there, um, there are times when it remains very wet. Um, if it's just a sort of gentle thing like this, then, and it doesn't really like flow with water for more than a little bit, you can just put grass in there, okay? And, um, uh, that is actually something that they use in agriculture. They use these grassy swales to um, direct runoff away from fields um, in periods of high rain. And then it's just grass the rest of the time. And if it's a, you know, a shallow thing, you can just mow it. So uh, if you can get away with that, that would be great. If you really need something you know, big that is more like a sort of rain garden thing or like that swale I showed going down the middle of the road, you know, there's lots of different rain garden plants that you can mm -hmm. find, you know, different Rudbeckia and other things. I'm no expert, so I don't want to really recommend that, but. Got it. Yep. Um, okay, next question. Are there any thoughts on plants that aren't going to fare well as the climate warms? Uh, well, uh, all plants. <laughs> it depends on how warm it gets. If we do nothing, um, we're going to, by 2100, well, I won't be here, but uh, by 2100, if we do nothing and the, the global average temperature rises by eight and a half degrees Fahrenheit, there will be many places where plants will, you know, crop plants are just not going to grow and there's not going to be enough water. So um, that's the kind of extreme. 
and, and that's business as usual, don't do anything to change things. That's not, we don't want to live in that future, so we really need to do something. Mm -hmm. um, the, on the near, more near term, uh, in our neck of the woods, things are getting hotter, and the summers are, um, we've had a lot of rain recently, but again, very, a lot of variation from year to year with the rain. Um, last year, we didn't have rain for like eight weeks, and, um, and so, you know, the plants need to be able to weather dry or wet. Um, and increasing heat. So you, you wouldn't want to pick plants um, for your garden that are at already at the southern end of their range because then if it warms up, it's, they're not going to be able to survive very well. So uh, like if you were picking trees, in fact, if there are uh, quite a few studies on this, picking trees, it's a good idea to pick trees that um, do well in, you know, more southerly states, North Carolina, mm -hmm. South Carolina, mm -hmm. et cetera. Because it's only going to get warmer. Those grow, those um, um, hardiness zones are just marching northwards. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not meaning to be an alarmist, but uh, the average temperature in the U.S. has already gone up over one degree centigrade. And um, we're heading for four, over four degrees centigrade if we do nothing, mm -hmm. and we really need to do something. So, yeah, um, that's a good advice. Next question is about violets. Um, this guest has a bed of wild violets, which they love, but by not mowing it, they're getting bindweed coming in, and that needs hand weeding. So, do you have any suggestions for that? Oh, um, it doesn't matter if you mow. I have a lot of violets in my yard. I mow. And they do fine. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I have a lot of bindweed. I hate that stuff. It's all over the place in those in those lawn mimic plots. Um, but uh, has the per has the person had trouble with the violets not doing well if they mow? I mean, just mow like three or four inches. Okay, that makes sense. Um, how do you feel about using sedges? I, uh, I, <laughs> why not, right? I don't have, uh, actually, there is a sedge that I've got growing out uh, along my driveway, and I'm, I have an area um, uh, by my driveway where my neighbor, who has 17 acres, all their stormwater comes through one culvert underneath their driveway, which comes whipping right along my fence. And I have a long driveway, which sort of extends from my main property. But this water comes swooshing down there. And um, I have been planting a bunch of native grasses and whatnot in there. And it turns out some sedges have appeared out there and I don't really know what they are. I grew some Pennsylvania sedge and I was a little bit down on it for a while. I, had, I bought one pot and divided it and put it out. And, and I thought, oh, this is really growing slowly. But it spread very quickly over one year. So I got a whole bunch of plants then this year. So I think sedges are great. Um, I think to a lot of people, they just look like grass. So um, I don't think you get a lot of mileage out of uh, planting sedges instead of, uh, I mean, you could have a whole, gra whole lawn of sedges. That would be great. You wouldn't have to have grass. You wouldn't have to mow it. Um, I, I think we're at the limit of my expertise here. <laughs> That's fair. Um, we did have one person who said they thought Master Gardeners were not supposed to promote um, any companies, so is Ernst okay or not okay to recommend? Just to clarify, we aren't recommending any businesses here. Um, if someone, you know, they had asked where to find something and that was how Ernst got mentioned. So you are correct in that Master Gardeners cannot promote or endorse any companies. Um, someone well, asked if about- somebody asks you where to get something? That's, I, do, I wouldn't consider that promoting a business. Yeah, I, would, I, was right. I think that's just information. That's where it's found, right? But you can't say, you know, this company has the best one or we oh, 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 oh. this one. Yeah. Or, you know. But you could say, you could go to Ernst Conservation Seed, you could go to Prairie Moon, you could do, you know, where. Sure. Yeah. As long as there's no preferences shown. Yeah. Um, kind of similar. Someone is asking about the paper that we're talking about that you used and if, if there's a brand or an official name, but it looks like it's just kind of that brown craft paper. Uh, no, it isn't just brown craft okay. paper because brown craft paper is thinner. 
Uh, that's what I initially thought I was going to use. Yeah. When okay. I got this stuff, I, I got it on Amazon. Um, you can get it elsewhere called Weed Guard. And um, it comes, I was delighted to find it came in these big rolls. And so I bought my first roll, um, my first hundred feet I got from Amazon. And then um, they raised the price or something on it. And um, uh, when I went to buy another roll, I just Googled Weed Guard. Uh, I think Weed Guard Plus is the, there, there's a heavyweight version and a lighter weight version. I, I like the heavyweight version. And um, I bought my second roll from a place called Gemplers, which sells everything. Um, and uh, it, they, it, it, the paper itself was really cheap. They had a, a very high shipping charge but it turns out still to be cheaper than Amazon. So just Google weed guard paper, and then you'll see what you have available. <laughs> okay, great. So you've just got a couple other comments, but it looks like no other questions here. You guys are great. You got a lot of good questions. There were a lot of good questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, so let me go ahead and stop the recording. I actually have one more that was sent to me directly. All right, thanks, um, Jenny. Go for it. Could overseeding uh, work on overtaking stilt grass? Uh, yeah, I th that that's my one of my goals um, <laughs> because the stilt grass comes up when there's very little competition. And um, in my backyard, uh, I had a ton of stilt grass, and um, which means in the winter you have nothing, right? Because it dies back. Um, and uh, so I overseeded last fall with this fine fescue mix and it came up, it did really great. And then the stilt grass didn't really, it wasn't able to germinate. Um, and then I made a fatal mistake, which was it had been raining, 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 and the grass was growing really fast. And so my son came over to cut the grass and I said, well, crank the mower down because I'm really tired of cutting it so often. Well, bad move. So I mowed too short. Fine fescue does not like to be mowed short. And it didn't rain for a while after that. Of course, it was right at the beginning of summer. The end of that sad story is the fine fescue kind of died back and then the stilt grass came back because there is an endless supply of seeds, silk, stilt grass seeds in the soil because they produce about a zillion seeds each. And so you've got to keep a cover on there and the fine fescue will, especially there are several kinds, two of the kinds are bunch grass, right? So they're individual plants, but two, two of the other kinds are um, uh, send out rhizomes so they, they creep and fill in and you get a pretty nice dense turf after a year or so and um, and so I think that yeah they will prevent the if, if you don't mow them in the summer which is key uh, and don't mow them ever sh uh, shorter than three inches then um, you can keep the stilt grass out. Great okay and then one last question that um... I had missed, where can you buy white clover? I think we talked earlier about where to buy micro clover. Oh, you can buy white clover at um, pretty much everywhere. I don't know if they have it at Home Depot, but you can buy it at Southern States or you can order it on the, on the, um, on the web. They have it at various kinds at Amazon. But um, I think the last bag I bought, I went to Southern States and bought it. Okay, and then um, for the conversation we were just having on silt grass, would you put herbicide down as well or just overseed? Uh, I, I don't put herbicide down on my own lawn. Um, uh, I, cause I, I don't know very much about herbicide. I don't really know what kind they get. And I just don't want to spray a lot of that stuff around. So, mm -hmm. um, I just plant the plants and, um, and then, um, you know, uh, hope for the best. Although this spring I did try something. This is like way in the realm of, um, totally not ready for prime time. But this spring, I have another area which was solid stilt grass. And I saw that stuff coming up when it was little, you know, little seedlings. And I had just bought a gallon of horticultural vinegar, 30%, which is way too, way more than you need. You can dilute it down to 15. And I went out with that 15% and I sprayed an area of that stilt grass and those little seedlings immediately croaked. And the, um, because seedlings don't have any 
root to sprout. They get no energy underground to sprout back up again. Um, uh, so I, uh, I uh, think that's a great thing to do if you have a bare area is zap those little seedlings and then plant something right away in the mm -hmm. spring. Great. Okay. We did have one more come in. Um, where was that question? Okay, maybe we didn't have another one come in. Oh yeah, where we are? Where do you buy fine fescue? Um, <clears throat> uh, well, if you want pure fine fescue, you have to go on the web and look for it. Um, I had, uh, I bought. We, we are using these custom mixes that um, of the sort of newest. Um, seed varieties, which actually I was really lucky. I had a seed company. I asked the seed company to donate uh, 10 pounds of each of like six kinds of seed for our experiments, which they did because you can't buy the stuff on, you know, homeowners can't really buy the stuff. Um, you can get a custom mix, but anyway, but um, there are a couple of companies that sell pretty good mixes. And this is what I used in my backyard. It was a mix from, again, that company Outside Pride that I bought the mini clover from. And I think it's called something like Legacy Fine Fescue Mix. But it was great. You know, I mean, um, the mixes we're testing might wind up being better, but uh, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with this. And um, I think you can get individual fine fescues at Ernst. And you could, there's four species of fine fescue. So you probably couldn't go wrong if you just mixed them in equal proportion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, any advice on how to get rid of Virginia buttonweed? I don't even know what it is. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. I um, probably have it, but I don't know what I, I don't sorry. know. Yeah. Um, are lawn mimics commercially available? Nah, uh, no, not yet. Well, um, let me uh, do a proviso on that. You can buy mixes, like there's one from Wildflower Farms called Eco Lawn, uh, and it is mostly fine fescue, but I think it also has some perennial ryegrass or something. It has some other fescue stuff in there, which I think is a little bit taller, um, but it's like a niche market. And so, you know, no surprise, it is hideously expensive. Um, it's, uh, like 50 bucks for maybe three pounds or five pounds or something like that, where, um, uh, and that's just because they're appealing to the environmentally minded homeowner who wants to do something good in their yard. And so they really rack the price up. I think that I got, um, 10 pounds of that legacy, um, fine fescue mix, for much less than fifty dollars, I, I don't I don't remember how much it was, but um, I would I I have remarked in my own mind how the uh, sort of if you Google no mow lawn, you'll get stuff that isn't all fine fescue. It has a few other things in there that that grow taller, and um, it'll be really expensive. Got it. Okay. That was the last one that came in, so I'm going to stop the recording.